Bonjour, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are on this on this planet, because um, you are a lot of uh, people coming from everywhere around the globe. So uh, I am Bruno Vinet from Spark News, and I'm happy to welcome you at this uh, third webinar on gender equality. Uh, today, uh, our theme is Women in Leadership, how to close the gap. Um, it's not a secret. Uh, women are powerful in driving the change. Um, benefits of uh, gender parity in leadership are more and more recognized. Yet, uh, women make up less than 10% of national leaders and represent less than a quarter of all elected politicians uh, in the world. So what's going on? Uh, how could we improve these numbers? Uh, to discuss this, um, we are lucky today to have four women at the top of the game. Uh, they know the struggle, they have succeeded, and they are very inspiring. So in less than an hour, uh, we're going to travel all around the globe and uh, meet uh, four people. So a former deputy president, a former prime minister, the first anchor woman uh, on uh, public uh, television, uh, French uh, television, sorry, and an expert TV, an expert, um, an expert journalist in equality and diversity at the Guardian. So these four people are going to be with you for the next hour, uh, and we're going to start uh, live with Australia. Uh, speaking of leadership, there's two next women have both been on different levels at a top position of their profession. So I'm very, very happy and honored to welcome Julia Gillard, the former uh, Prime Minister of Australia, and uh, Christina Krantz. Uh, she's a prominent figure of the French uh, and European media landscape. And she's the one who's been the first anchor woman ever on the French television. Uh, so when, uh, when the male uh, we're very prominent on this industry. So I think they know what they're going to talk together. So please, Christine, the floor is yours. Merci, Bruno. Bonjour. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Prime Minister. It's indeed a, an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, before we, we talk about women in leadership, and I believe it's actually the title uh, of your uh, of your book, a book which has just been uh, published, a question which, of course, unfortunately, is a worldwide uh, uh, worry: uh, the pandemic. W what is the situation actually in your part of Australia? I believe you live in Adelaide. I do. I live in Adelaide, which is a city of just over a million people. And I'd have to say things are going well here. Uh, we basically don't have any of the virus in community transmission now. Uh, we occasionally have cases of Australians returning from overseas who are positive for the virus. But we have a very strict uh, hotel quarantine system. So if you arrive from overseas, you've got to be in a supervised hotel for 14 days. So any of those incoming cases can be dealt with and don't cause community transmission. Uh, so, you know, really um, in Australia, I think the virus has uh, been handled well. We've got a good healthcare system. We've had good systems for pandemic preparedness, uh, good responses from uh, people from all sides of politics. And that's uh, meant that circumstances, I think, are easier here than they are in France or in, and in many parts of the world. And are you are you uh, getting ready for for vaccination? Is there much uh, controversy about vaccines, or are people willing and hopeful, indeed, uh, that in the coming few weeks uh, they will have access uh, to such vaccines? I think people are overwhelmingly hopeful. Our government has said that the vaccine would be available here in February and March next year. So we're just a little bit behind uh, the rollout in places like the UK. Um, 
you know, like uh, all um, countries around the world, there are people who are quite opposed to vaccines. There are many people who are hesitant. I think they'll have to be persuaded. Uh, and one of the things that will probably help persuade them is uh, people will be able to watch uh, what's happening in the UK, what's happening in Canada and some of the other early adopters uh, before vaccines are rolled out here. Of course, and, and France included, and uh, we, we should have access to that vaccine uh, at the very end of December or, or early uh, January. So let's get to the core of this uh, conversation, women in leadership. And that's the title you have uh, chosen for your book. And it's tell us about that book and, and tell us about your co-writer, a very impressive lady as well. Uh, yes, she is. I co-authored uh, the book with Ngozi Okonjiri-Wheeler, uh, who is a former foreign minister and finance minister of Nigeria, the first woman to serve in either of those two posts. She's a well-known development economist. She's been chairing the Global Vaccine Alliance. I got to know her in that capacity while uh, I've been chairing the Global Partnership for Education. So we were both involved in the development community in the multilateral world. And she is the the incoming Director General of the World Trade Organization. And so our book is about bringing the real life experiences of eight global leaders, uh, women who have been at the highest levels of politics, as well as the global research on women and leadership. And what we wanted to do is to take the research uh, to then ask the women who have lived through it, does this research ring true to you? Is this how you experienced your life? Uh, and then make some conclusions. We do include in it some lessons for the media about how to portray women leaders. I'm very happy well, to talk about them. But uh, what, what is interesting, I haven't read the book, unfortunately, but I hope it will uh, eventually get translated. Um, and, but it hasn't reached our shores. Uh, but it, it seems that what is interesting is that of all the, the women you, you have uh, talked to, you know, from Hillary Clinton to uh, many world leaders, uh, the, uh, the analysis is pretty much the same. Uh, they, you, uh, we have had to confront uh, almost exactly uh, the same obstacles, uh, the same uh, contempt, uh, the same harassment at times. Uh, tell us about that. What has struck you most in, in this sort of convergence of, uh, of remarks? It did strike me very strongly. When Ngozi and I started on the process of doing the book, we picked women from all around the world. So yes, Hillary Clinton, Theresa May, Prime Minister Erna Solberg from Norway, Jacinda Ardern from my part of the world, Christine Lagarde, who of course has headed the International Monetary Fund. Uh, but we also included uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the first woman to lead a nation in Africa. She was president of Liberia. Joyce Bander, the second woman to lead a nation in Africa. She was president of Malawi. Uh, Michelle Bachelet, who was president on two occasions of Chile, the first woman to hold that position. And I did, going into this, think there will be such huge differences of culture and context yeah that the women will say quite different things. And of course, those differences of culture and context did speak and did matter. You know, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf had to flee into exile. She was imprisoned at one point. Michelle Bachelet was tortured at one point during the Pinochet regime. So they're not the sorts of experiences that, you know, I had had or Jacinda Ardern's had or, uh, you know, women like Theresa May. But when you looked um, at the, at the rest of their experiences, what you found was a commonality. Women from these very different parts of the world talked about um, being judged on appearance and the reporting of them as leaders are focusing far too much on appearance and them needing to find strategies to deal with that. Uh, each of them talked about a disproportionate interest in family life, uh, whether they had kids, what their kids were doing, who was looking after the kids, a great deal of focus on it. Um, each of them talked about 
uh, a hesitancy that people weren't sure whether or not they could uh, lead. Uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, in fact, talked about going as president to a meeting of the African Union with other presidents and still sensing that hesitancy that she had to somehow earn her place in that room as a woman, even though she was there as of right because she was the president of an African nation. Um, many of them felt in different ways the force of uh, the psychological stereotypes which we know surround women. Uh, we all have sexist murmurings in the back of our brain that tell us what to expect men are, to, are going to be like and what women are going to be like. We expect women to be nurturing, empathetic, selfless, to put the team's needs in front of their own. We don't expect them to be ambitious for self. We don't expect them to be power hungry. Uh, so when a woman is in politics, she's powerful, she's leading, she's commanding, it's very easy for people to say, you know, something is discordant here, something is jarring me, I don't think she's very likeable, I think she's probably quite nasty, I don't think she's kind, I don't think she's empathetic. And uh, some of our women leaders had felt the force of this very strongly, Hillary Clinton in particular. And this was very common across cultures and contexts. Would you say it was also your own experience? I understand you went into politics in your, I think in your mid-30s, you, you were a lawyer in a firm uh, before, you went into politics and uh, what struck me uh, reading your, your bio is that uh, you, you, you were uh, uh, an activist for, for the Labour Party and when you became a member of government, you, you were given uh, several portfolios which seem very women-oriented, education, social inclusion. Would you say that in those years, um, that was when? Um, 2007. Yeah. 2007. Would you say that in those years, uh, the, the choice of, of these particular portfolios was very much linked to, to your gender? Uh, no, I wouldn't. Um, and I do think that there is a, a phenomenon in politics that uh, people think uh, that women go into politics because they're interested in pursuing women's issues and women get um, put into uh, the social protection, social services areas. Uh, you do see that across governments around the mm. world. Actually, for me personally, at that stage, I was Deputy Prime Minister. I chose my portfolios and I had a mega portfolio, uh, which included employment, workplace relations, as well as education and social inclusion. So I'd wanted to bring the whole government's human capital agenda together in one place. Uh, but what I certainly experienced as Deputy Prime Minister and then Prime Minister uh, were the factors that I talked about before. I mean, to give you just a couple of very snapshot examples, um, you know, when I took my first overseas trip as Prime Minister, I went to Afghanistan, Australian soldiers were fighting there. I then went to Brussels to meet with the head of NATO uh, to talk about our strategy in fighting that war. And literally the first reports in Australia said, you know, Julia Gillard wearing a short white jacket and black pants today met with the Secretary General of NATO. So even when you were talking about a war fighting strategy, mm -hmm. apparently journalists thought what you were wearing was worthy of comment. Uh, then in my political rise before I was Prime Minister, a Conservative Senator described me as deliberately barren because I don't have children and used that to suggest that I didn't understand anything about ordinary family life. Uh, and it really highlighted for me that for women in politics, there's really no right answer to the question, do you have children? If you don't, then you get characterised as out of touch. If you do, then who's looking after them? That will be the question that's put to you next as you're going about this business of politics. And certainly the, the tropes about unlikability, about women who are uh, seeking power, being sort of, you know, Lady Macbeth style figures, uh, witches, you know, all of those sorts of words came very much to the fore in the critical characterisations of me. So the discourse was incredibly gendered. 
And that, um, you know, that was my political opponents, but it was an, also the media. And, you know, given we've got uh, journalists here, I think we have to make that point. It was, um, you know, very common for journalists to use, I think, unthinkingly, uh, language around me which used these sexist stereotypes, which um, would not have been used around a male politician, which doesn't mean he wouldn't have been criticised. Of course, you know, uh, politicians should be criticised. They should be held to account. They should have a white hot spotlight shined on them. Uh, but the way in which that criticism is put should not be through the prism of gender, and it routinely was. In, in my trade, journalism, and you just mentioned the attitude, uh, sort of gender-oriented, all these remarks about uh, attire, uh, looks, uh, hairstyle. I, I, I wrote a book some time ago about Hillary Clinton, and she was always criticized because how can you trust, that was the saying at the time, how can you trust a woman who changes her hairstyle so often? Uh, but to, to get back to your experience, in my trade, uh, and, and it's a great uh, achievement, uh, and it's true uh, all over uh, the Western world, uh, there are many more women journalists uh, than, say, 30 years ago, when, when I started, uh, at least in, in television. Would you say that women journalists or, or women colleagues in general are necessarily, how could I put it politely, more, more generous or more lenient or more open than their male counterparts? I mean, is there indeed sorority in, in that uh, sense? Or, or do you feel that indeed, you know, there can be as much uh, competition, as much rivalry, or indeed at times uh, from other women a, a, a sort of uh, unease about the fact that you're in charge? I think there's a mix and I think it's changing over time. I mean, for me, when I was Prime Minister, uh, the discourse about uh, gender and politics wasn't as sophisticated as it is now. And it's, you know, only 10 years ago, but I think a lot has changed in that 10 years. And, um, you know, through some of the work uh, that I do now, I hope I'm a contributor to that change. I chair the Global Institute uh, for Women's Leadership at King's College London, and we produce all sorts of research, which I think helps speed this discourse. So I think women journalists now are more likely to see the sexism and hopefully therefore more likely to show solidarity. Uh, when I was uh, there in politics, less so. And I know from talking to women journalists since that a number of them did want to show more solidarity, but they were working in predominantly male newsrooms and the, you know, pressure was put on them. You know, if you were, uh, Christine, if you were being sent to interview me as Prime Minister, someone would say to you, you know, don't go soft on her, don't go soft on her just because she's a woman, don't you do all of that sisterhood stuff, like you're there to get a hard-hitting political interview. And that then puts an extra pressure on you that if you don't put that edge on it, if it isn't critical, if it isn't forceful, if it isn't hard hitting, uh, that you will be criticised by others. And so I think women journalists felt that pressure and perhaps continue to still feel that pressure. And in some ways, uh, it breeds an environment where women journalists go harder on women politicians rather than go <laughs> fairly on them. I don't think women journalists should go softer. I most assuredly do not. I think they should go fairly. In, in, <clears throat> sorry, in one of the studies published uh, by King's College, you were just referring uh, to um, your responsibility there. There's a very interesting story, uh, study about the differences uh, of coverage or comments between um, Margaret Thatcher and Theresa May. Um, that is to say what? Well, some 30 years yes. time span <clears throat> and uh, I was struck by the fact that indeed uh, sexist remarks uh, have been more constant, more numerous. In the case of Theresa May, 
than there were in the case of, of uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher. How do you explain that? Yes, this is a terrific piece of research undertaken by a young Australian researcher called Blair Williams. So I'll do a little advertisement for, uh, for, for Blair and Australian research. Uh, but she did uh, study the uh, coverage of uh, Margaret Thatcher in the first two weeks she was Prime Minister. So that was in 1979, uh, mm -hmm. compared with the first two weeks of Theresa May and found the coverage was more gendered now. Uh, there was much more likely, for example, to be comment, uh, comments about appearance and clothing. And whilst uh, this wasn't in the two week period, I think you would probably remember as an example of this phenomenon, uh, when Theresa May was uh, meeting with Nicola Sturgeon, the Scottish leader, to talk about Brexit and the implications for the unity of the United Kingdom, one of the tabloid newspapers had, you know, forget Brexit, who won legs it uh, with a photo of Theresa May and, and Nicola Sturgeon wearing uh, skirts so you could see their legs and they were inviting you to judge who had the better legs. Um, now, I think really what has happened between 1979 and now is not that the world's got more sexist, I don't believe that, but I think uh, media standards have changed and some things would be published about a politician now that would never have been published in 1979 mm, at a, a sense of deference and politeness. You know, no, I, don't, I can't imagine a British journalist in 1979 feeling free to comment about Margaret Thatcher's legs. Um, you know, no, polite. I think he, he would have been fired immediately. Yes. So, I mean, there's a coarsening, isn't there, of our media discourse because you know, traditional media is in competition with social media. Uh, everybody needs the clicks. You need the eyeballs. You've got to attract people to your coverage. Uh, the economic model for traditional media is so, so challenged uh, that those pressures lead people to go down paths of coverage, which just would have been uh, put to one side in the traditional media model of 10, 20, 30 years ago. Would you say that social media uh, um, are improving uh, the situation or, on the contrary, uh, are making it worse when, when it comes to uh, the way women in leadership are considered? I think, once again, it's a mixed picture. There is no doubt, and there have been Amnesty International studies around the world that show this, there's no doubt that of the... Uh, critical, ugly, often violent uh, tweets that go up about politicians, and it's not just politicians, it's women who are in the public eye generally, um, that the, the tweets are far more likely to be about women than men. Um, Amnesty International did a fantastic piece of research about uh, the British election and showed that women got much more of this ugliness online than men did, and women of colour got more again. Mm. Um, so, you know, there is a lot to deal with when it comes to social media and women and leadership. Having said that, social media does enable us to connect in different ways and women have been use it, using it as a mobilising tool. So in the US election campaign, there was a spiralling out from uh, Time's Up of a campaign called hashtag we have her back. And so whenever a sexist or a racist thing was said about a candidate from either side of politics in the US election, uh, you know, community members mobilised to push back against that sexism and racism. Now, obviously, the person around whom most of that congregated was Vice President Harris because she was the most high-profile female politician in the campaign, but it was genuinely a bipartisan effort. So I think social media... Um, you know, can be used for good, but it certainly has this seamy underside when it comes to treatment of women. You, you mentioned uh, the vice president-elect, Kamala Harris, who will certainly be a very interesting uh, political personality to follow in, in the coming uh, months and, and years. Uh, it seems that uh, Joe Biden, the president-elect, and I think we're all eagerly waiting for him to, to take office, frankly, um, uh, the next, the forthcoming administration uh, is very gender balanced, 
I, I think there are more women uh, in in high profile uh, jobs than ever before, more diversity balanced as well. Uh, would you say that's indeed uh, 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 a omen that times are changing in, 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 in the best possible direction? I, I hope so. And I do think given uh, that uh, around the world, people do look to American politics, we all talk about American politics, that uh, the example that comes from it is important to the world. And I thought the repudiation of Hillary Clinton for Donald Trump sent a very negative message to the world and a very negative message about the prospects of female candidates. So it's uh, fantastic now to get to the stage where a Biden administration is looming with many women and with diversity. But I don't think we can just assume that we are on an upwards roll, that, uh, you know, around the world, what we see is you can go through a process of uh, one step forward and two steps back. I mean, here in Australia, I was our first female Prime Minister when government changed uh, and the new cabinet was appointed under the Conservative government. It only had one woman in it. So we went from having me and women in a range of very key portfolios to only having one woman in that next government in an important portfolio. Uh, so we've, we've always got to keep the campaigning efforts up. And it's important to remember sitting here now, fully 70% of countries on earth have never been led by a woman, including, of course, France. Um, and there are only a limited number of countries that have been led by a woman more than once. And there are only two countries that have had three women leaders, New Zealand and Iceland. Uh, so we've got a lot to do to ensure that women routinely come through for leadership. And, and it gets to be so routine that you don't bother commenting on it anymore, that one tick of the clock in French politics, you have a male president, the next tick of the clock, you have a female president, and so it goes. Um, and it gets to the stage where no one can really remember how many women there have been because it's so routine to have a woman as president. We're certainly not there yet. You know, there's been a survey uh, in Europe about uh, the, the handling of the pandemic. And it shows that, in fact, it's those governments uh, led by women who have performed best, uh, starting with Madame Merkel in, in Germany. I think her approval ratings now is above 70%, which is unheard of in, in most democracies. Uh, and also uh, Finland, Denmark, and, and so on and so forth. But in the few minutes that we still have left, Let's talk about what's needed to, to improve upon uh, the situation. Uh, and obviously, it starts with education, education of girls, but also boys. I agree with that. I think, uh, you know, gender stereotyping uh, starts very young. Uh, it starts in family homes and it starts in schools. And we've got to be mindful of that from the very first moment that people, uh, you know, describe a young girl organising the games in the playground as little Miss Bossy Boots, but they describe a young boy doing the same thing as a natural leader. Uh, you know, from that moment on, you're getting gendered characterisations and stereotypes. Uh, but whilst that's really important, I don't want to wait until today's children are adults uh, to see dramatic change. And I do think that uh, the media can be part of shaping the change that we need to see. One piece of research we did at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, which I would commend people's attention to, was looking at the media in the UK, the US and Australia around COVID and who was quoted as experts in articles mm. on COVID. And it showed when you were talking about something like domestic violence that more female experts were quoted. But when you were talking about the economy or um, science, many more uh, men were quoted. I mean, you know, two, I'm talking at the difference between um, one woman being quoted to every 19 men, not a small difference. Uh, and you know, that even if you controlled for the fact that each of those three nations is led by men, more male politicians were quoted in articles than female politicians. 
um, journalists can change that. You know, I know people uh, have their uh, people that they go to, their contact list, they need to speak to an economist, they know the one they're going to ring. Uh, but I would urge people to say, diversify your contact list. Think about whether you could ring a female scientist and get her on your show or in your newspaper or whatever it is that you publish. Uh, because as long as we're going down that cycle of expertise kind of predominantly equals male, uh, then we are cutting out a whole avenue for women and for young women to know that they can aspire to these walks of life. And then second, and we give this advice in the book, um, I would uh, say to journalists, you know, when you're thinking about your, if you, you're doing a voiceover or a written piece, um, intellectually in your mind substitute a male name for the female name and ask yourself if I was uh, telling the story of uh, Maria, uh, instead of telling the story of Pierre, uh, would, would I have written it the same way? Have I written an opening sentence that says, um, Maria, mother of two, uh, wearing a checked jacket, uh, today said X, and if I was uh, reporting Pierre, would I have just gone, Pierre says Y? Um, and mm. left all of the things about appearance and family life out. I mean, I think there's a real test there that we can hold ourselves to account for. I, I must say, when it comes to women experts in, in the media, there's a genuine effort uh, in France, uh, and particularly in, in the public service, uh, uh, in my radio station, France Culture, for instance. Uh, you know, we make a point of having always uh, one or two women experts in, in any program. And, and indeed, COVID is a very uh, interesting moment in, in that respect, in many respects, by the way, but in that respect, because indeed in science, uh, there are many women. L look at the women who together with her husband, but still, uh, uh, the, the, the biotech um, firm in Germany, uh, you know, you have many women who, who, who are still, so to speak, behind the scene, but, but who get promoted or who get more visibility uh, because of the, of the pandemic. And that's true in the Western world. It's, of course, uh, more, so much more difficult in, in other parts of the world. But uh, even in China, uh, where indeed the, the narrative around the pandemic has been a major effort by, by uh, the Chinese uh, regime. And I believe that you in Australia, you are well placed to know how, how much hardship uh, your country is, is currently uh, going through uh, for having asked uh, for a serious investigation about the roots of the, the, the pandemic, but still, uh, even in China, you, you, you see prominent women or women put forward when it comes to scientific research. Uh, Bruno, I, I'm afraid we, yeah. we already have come yeah. to... <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I, I must say a lot of people are hooked to your conversation. It's just so interesting. So we've got a lot of questions coming from everywhere. And I would like to start, if you don't mind, with a man asking a question and it's a very media focus is Jill Demtos from is a director for Asia Pacific of the Asian American Journalist Association and his question is very simple I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer it um, really but well we're going to answer obviously but not all the answers what specific role can news media play in changing the perception of society on women as leaders? Well, I think it does come back to uh, some of the conversation we've just had. I think uh, who who the media uh, puts forward. Uh, so, I mean, it starts with, you know, who is the media? Uh, is, the, is the media, uh, you know, disproportionately male journalists, male presenters, male newspaper editors, uh, or is it a truly diverse uh, cohort of people who are bringing us the news? So it starts there. I think it then uh, encompasses this question of who does the media rely on for commentary? Is that gender balanced and diverse in other ways? 
And then it uh, comes to the question of is the media uh, putting the information and the stories and the commentary to us uh, in a way that is gendered or are they doing it in a way that uh, is, you know, neutral on gender? Are we mm. reading articles which promote historic stereotypes? Uh, you know, is an animated um, a uh, female leader described as angry and out of control, whereas a man would be described as passionate. Uh, is a woman leader who sheds a tear described as cracking under pressure, uh, whereas a man who shed a tear would be seen as showing his softer side and people would be approving of that. You know, how is the media reporting with all of these stereotypes? Are you getting it in or getting it out of the coverage? Um, all of those things matter for uh, the perceptions that people have about the role of men and the character, role of men and women and the characteristics of men and women. Yeah, I must say, uh, if I asked, if I started with a question from a man, once again, we talked about it before, we need to be both gender really keen on these things, otherwise we never go anywhere. Yes. Um, anyway, another question from Audrey, who is a French journalist. Um, I think, uh, Julia, this question should be for you, I guess. I would like to know how you feel about the glass cliff in political leadership maybe concerning Theresa May in particular, how do you think this is affecting the image of women as capable of leadership position? Yeah, I think the glass cliff is uh, clearly a phenomenon. And we need to remember that the whole analysis about the glass cliff started because of the media. It started because of a report in the Times newspaper, which analyzed businesses and share price and then said, uh, women CEOs are bad for share price. Share prices are lower under female CEOs. And then academic researchers unpacked all of that and actually found what was happening was that businesses that were going badly said to themselves, we're in trouble, we've got to try something new, what are we going to do? Oh, we've never had a woman CEO before, why don't we try that? Um, so, you know, businesses that were going well it's kind of steady as she goes. Next CEO should look a lot like the old CEO, man, get a man. It was the businesses in trouble that got female leaders. Um, and I think uh, there is some of that at play in politics too. Of course, in politics, there's not a measurement uh, quite as precise and comparable as the share price. So these things come down to matters of judgment a fair bit more. But I do think when you look at Theresa May's uh, political career thrust into um, the prime ministership after the unexpected resignation of David Cameron when the nation was trying to digest the Brexit result, um, I can understand why people describe that as a glass cliff moment. Um, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Another question from Crystal. Who is, uh, Crystal is from Australia. Julia, you mentioned previously that women often have to prove themselves regardless of how qualified they are. How do you, we deal with it and change that both at the local and global levels? I think firstly, it starts with simply knowing that each of us has these stereotypes in our head. Um, if, we, if we can shine a light on these sexist stereotypes, if we can get them from the back of our brains out into the light, they can't survive in the light, they can't survive scrutiny. And that then um, means that instead of just succumbing to those stereotypes of, uh, you know, has this woman got it? You can, you can be asking yourself the question, do I really think that because there's some reason to think that she's not competent or am I succumbing to a sexist stereotype? You can ask yourself the next question. So I think dialogue shining a light on these things is really important. Um, and then I do think I am a big advocate when uh, people sit down for formal meetings and interactions of just centering yourself in the group around what hat people are wearing. Um, so I do think it's important for everyone, but women leaders in particular, to remind, you know, I'm, I'm here convening this discussion in my capacity as Prime Minister because what we want to achieve out of this discussion is 
or I'm here convening this meeting in my capacity as, you know, revenue officer for a branch of the business uh, because we are going to discuss today and work through trends in our revenue. And so you are reminding people to react to you based on the expertise and the office or the, the position you hold, uh, rather than just letting the reactions uh, float and consequently be around gender. Yes, thank you. Um, I've got maybe the last question, maybe we'll see if we've got a, some time for a, lot, a very last one, but this one from Claire Derville from France 24. Um, I think that's, uh, this question is for both of you. Madeleine Albright said, there is a special place in hell for women who don't support all the women. Uh, it seems like the, the effort uh, aiming at closing the gender gap focus a lot around men, but what about women's solidarity? Don't they have a big role to play in women advancement as well by changing the way they treat each other? Yes. I'd rather leave the last word to, to the Prime Minister. So what I would say, I, and I tried to, to, uh, to make that point earlier uh, in our conversation, is that um, in my experience, you cannot necessarily rely on other women's support uh, when you're in a position of authority, when you're the boss, uh, when you're the editor-in-chief, uh, when you lead a, a company, uh, and, and probably in my experience in the media uh, it's not obvious you know uh, you may have other women who resent in fact the fact that you're the boss and, and they're not uh, almost in the same way uh, and some sometimes in a more insidious way than men uh, we actually entitled one of the chapters of our book, uh, A Special Place in Hell, uh, using that great Madeleine Albright quote. Uh, and we tried to ask squarely, how crowded is this that special place in hell going to be? Are we all going there? <laughs> um, and we uh, came, came to a series of uh, conclusions. I mean, one, when you look at the evidence, some of the stereotypes about the queen bee boss who pulls up the drawbridge and makes sure that no other women get through, some of those stereotypes fall away. And often it's not the individual woman who has caused that to happen, so much as the business or organisation that says to itself, ah, we've got one woman, we've done that now, enough with the gender thing, let's move on. Um, so uh, there, there's that which can often be blamed on women but isn't the fault of women. But we do squarely then look in the eye something we end up describing as the politics of scarcity, which is because women have been moving into male structures, you know, whether it's a corporate board, a cabinet, whether it's a team in a newsroom, it's been historically predominantly male, then, you know, one or two or three women get into the team. But the, the vast, you know, number of positions are still held by men. So a team of 10, seven spots routinely held by men, three by women. And it's easy for the individual women to then come to the conclusion, if I want to get on that team, my competitor isn't everybody in that group of my 10. My competitor is the three women. I need to take out one of the three women in order to get a chance. Um, and that, the politics of scarcity, can breed a set of behaviours where women aren't supportive to women. And we understand that um, in the book, but we do try and make the recommendation, work with women and sympathetic men to take the step back and look at the bigger picture and say, not how am I going to win this game with its currently constructed rules, but how am I going to change the rules of this game? So routinely, this is an equitable and diverse team. Thank you, Julia. Just a very last question to finish on a very inspiring note. It's for you, Julia. It's from Pooja from India. And she's just asking, who, who, is the, who are the current women leaders you find inspiring? I've got a little bit of an idea of who you are going to talk about. But... Uh, I'm, I'm obviously certainly uh, going to say, sitting here in Australia, I'm certainly going to say Jacinda Ardern. Uh, we interviewed her for our book and she is an inspiring leader. Uh, and, you know, that gives me hope, watching her leadership. 
Uh, but what gives me a lot of hope too is she is crystal clear that circumstances are different for her as a female leader because she's the third woman to lead her country. Uh, there was Jenny Shipley, then Helen Clark for a long time, and now Jacinda. And so that should give us a lot of hope that if the more women that come through, the easier it gets, the more space there is for women. Uh, Chancellor Merkel, I think, is an incredibly inspiring figure, the length of her leadership, the calibre of her leadership, and it is still there, um, I think, inspiring the world. So uh, she gives me a lot of hope in a different part of the world too. Uh, Erna Solberg in Norway, I think, has done incredibly well in the pandemic. Uh, so there are many women leaders to look to and follow in today's world. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Christine. Uh, it has been a, a pleasure to have this conversation with you both. And uh, we have so many people still with us on this round table, mean, meaning that they're really passionate about your conversation. And thank you again. Good luck, Julia, for, for the book and for your next steps in politics. I don't know if you have any <laughs> ideas of going back there or but <laughs> you'll do a lot of things still. And thank you, Christine, again for uh, for uh, discussing with, with Julia uh, today. So thanks again. And um, so we're gonna go in New York now. Uh, so um, we are uh, moving uh, to New York. Uh, not um, we are, we are not we're not going to be live because it's it's just a nightmare to. Uh, uh, organize at roundtable with at the same time Australia, Europe, and New York. That's that's just a nightmare, not possible. So uh, we managed to uh, record yesterday a very nice chat between um, Fuzile Mlambo Guka, uh, who is a, a great and very 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 inspiring woman. She's the former deputy president of South Africa. And today she's the executive director on, of uh, UN Women. And uh, she's interviewed by Alexandra Topping, who is a senior new reporter at The Guardian and uh, equality and diversity experts. Thank you for joining us um, for this Spark News Media event into Women in Leadership. And um, with me, I have from Zili Malambo and Kuka, and I am so delighted to be able to speak to her today, one of um, the groundbreaking politicians of her of her era and it really is it really is an honor for me to to speak to you and um, it feels like your job has never been more important never been more pressured and probably never been harder do you think that's a, an accurate representation yeah no definitely it's gotten complicated we are already projecting that uh, we were not going to reach uh, our objectives, the objectives of the of the SDGs, and that uh, we needed uh, to accelerate uh, the interventions. And with COVID, it just changed everything. If ever there was a moment to make us realize how far we have to come this is the moment isn't it because we we feel like those hard-earned gains were perhaps brittle brittle not built on the on as firm a foundation mm. as we might have thought it also brings into sharp relief doesn't it just how vitally important it is that to come to the theme of, of what we're talking about today how important it is to have women in in roles of leadership yeah in your opinion has there been sufficient um, recognition of the gendered impact of COVID in governments throughout throughout the globe? Even when there is recognition, uh, the actions that are taken uh, are not equal to the to to the challenge that mm. we are facing. So, for instance, 144 countries. Uh, responded to, to the Secretary General's call uh, on dealing with uh, violence, uh, which we saw uh, increasing uh, uh, du during COVID. But the fact that the Gulf government, 144, acknowledged that this, this was a problem. Uh, you do not have 144 countries who have changed their strategy drastically mm -hmm. in response. 
Uh, I think uh, the point I, 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 I'm, I'm always making about this issue of violence against women is that it is a, a pandemic in its own right. Mm -hmm. And we now know what it takes to fight a pandemic. Why do you think there is this lack of urgency among governments? The lack of, of uh, leadership of women at the most strategic places, you know, so increasing women's leadership uh, is something that would uh, uh, definitely change. And a critical mass of women mm -hmm. uh, who would be able to take decisions without having to refer to somebody. Uh, the fact that women are not, in many cases, the ones with the, out, the final say uh, means that their decision making and their choices uh, of interventions that is needed still need to be underwritten. And also, we don't have women everywhere where we need them um, because gender, gender inequality happens everywhere. I mean that's that's what we're talking about isn't it like if we're if if we really are going to see this if we are going to face what is really happening then it requires more than tinkering around the edges oh yeah it requires a fundamental overhaul of the entire yeah. system in your view is there any is there any sense that there is a willingness to do that or do you see any hope in any examples that of other of countries where they you know they are moving towards that direction i'm always using this uh, example of 25 years ago where we started just so that you can have a sense of of the journey traveled uh you know we had uh, maybe about 10 countries which had legislation uh that addresses gender equality mm -hmm. uh now we were 144 countries and 25 have also amended their constitution so that is significant uh, because it protects uh, all the women in those countries because when you change legislation uh, you are uh, providing a, a dispensation for everybody and the changes in the laws that has happened has uh, covered more than two billion women but guess what they still about two billion women who also lives in in jurisdiction where some of their rights are not covered in law in, in your view is that where in countries where there is a higher female participation in civic society and in politics or where we have strong female leaders both in politics or in or in other fields have those countries Perform, a performed better and B performed in a more gender inclusive way. Yeah, you know, a combination of uh, uh, women in leadership. You know, you know whether you're talking New Zealand or the Nordic countries where they have female heads of states. Uh, a country, the state of Kerala in India, just that state with the. A health minister who was a woman who was leading from the front of the pandemic certainly uh, we have seen a, a, a more engendered response uh, but also not just an engendered response a people-centered response mm -hmm. where there was a, a focus on both fighting from the health side dealing with the issues of uh, just the needs of people and at the same time looking at uh, the, the economic issues uh, at, 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 at a macro level, a combination of that and not uh, bringing politics into it and being inclusive uh, in terms of decision making and working with everybody, working across uh, political uh, parties, etc. Absolutely, and yeah. with bearing that in mind, mm. if we have, um, you know, we have these examples, these ha positive examples, mm. both in in polit the political sphere and in civic society. How can we improve that engagement, and how do we pave the way for women to take a more active role in the decisions that affect their lives? I, I think we should not stop 
uh, our activism has been renewed and we've been given a greater sense of agency and we must not associate this with the pandemic this is our life <laughs> you know pandemic or no pandemic uh, mm -hmm. because any slowing down or reduction of the pressure would just mean that uh, we go all the way back uh, to levels of inadequacy uh, that even is worse than what was there before uh, before the pandemic so uh, uh, stay staying focused and engaged uh, and then consolidating our demands because there's one thing that also has also come out is just the similarities that are there in mm. many countries. Uh, and, and again, I come back to why we want generation equality uh, to be a global campaign that involves everybody on a few of the issues that we think uh, can be game changers if they're addressed. It is because we recognize that uh, there is no one country that can handle this alone. Governments have to hear this from everybody everywhere. And yeah. you use the multilateral system uh, as a platform where we bring these issues because that is where all, all of them come together. So this is really the moment. It's do or die. This, this is the, really the moment. You know, I thought I was getting ready to retire. I, I, I recognize that. Uh -uh. This is, oh, no way. this is not the time uh, we and we do need though to bring in young people their radical impatience is refreshing and mm. their perspective and expectations from life which uh, i think is less forgiving than ours is also a critical advantage that we need and this next year that we're going to have the generation equality forum um, are you confident that it will go ahead for a start? And can you assure us of that? And what can we look forward to? It's definitely going to go ahead. Uh, I've got the paper, they've signed. <laughs> <laughs> Great news. And also, they, I mean, they're participating. All, all the state, different stakeholders are, uh, are participating. We have got dates and, and, and all of that. But I mean, the, the, impo the important thing is not just the forum itself where we get together is what we will be bringing to the forum. Uh, so the six themes uh, uh, that we're working in uh, will determine the kinds of, act of actions that we would have agreed to take. So what you can expect is what are we going to do different on violence against women, which is one of the themes. Uh, economic justice uh, I definitely we will tackle the issue of care in economic justice because it's 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 crippling us uh, we will uh, tackle the issue of macroeconomic policies mm. uh, that are responsive to women under economic justice we are dealing another theme is climate uh, women and climate justice uh, we will look at uh, the different ways in which uh, uh, the the way we deal with climate change impacts uh, on women. The other issue is SRHR. Uh, again, uh, the accessibility of services that women need in order to make sure their reproductive rights and health needs are addressed adequately. So that's, an, that's, another, that's, that's another theme. And innovation and technology uh, is another theme. And women's leadership. So... Um, <laughs> I I would love to ask you um, because you you are such a trailblazer, the first uh, female deputy president in your country. What was the best piece of advice anyone gave you as a as a political leader? You know, it's when you are on the on a platform, the platform that you have been given make sure that you, when you enter into any meeting, have an objective to, to, to use every moment to push something because that moment will never return. Mm. 
and you may not get uh, what you want at that moment but you may plant a seed so that you you follow up at another time or at another platform so i guess it is and, and the message was to be in leadership is about using every opportunity not a night as a nice to meet but mm -hmm. as a nice to do push mm -hmm. every button that you, you you can push wherever you are that's incredible <laughs> and Zuli, i think i think that's us we're out of time thank you thank well, it has been an absolute honor to speak to you and um, thank you for being such a trailblazer thank you for showing the way for so so many other women and thank you for fighting the good fight every day wow what a thursday morning what discussion that was very inspiring I'm, i guess you had a very good time i hope you had a as good time as we had to prepare this uh, this moment for you guys um I think uh, I'm afraid we have to close the session. Um, thank you so much to our great speakers. Thank you to Mfuzile, to Julia, to Christine, and to Alexandra. Uh, thank you all participants from all over the planet. You are so many from all over the place. So thank you very much to be with us. Uh, please note that you'll receive a newsletter soon with all information and links to replay and with the complete video of, uh, of uh, Fuzile and uh, Alexandra. Please, when you get this newsletter, don't hesitate to forward to, uh, forward to anyone around you, especially male friends, to be sure that they get all these messages. Um, our next meeting is in January, and the theme would be women and uh, economic, uh, economic opportunities. I want to thank uh, Anissa, Audrey, Flo, and all the Spark News team. I want to thank, of course, the um, Foundation Bill, Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates. And um, uh, enjoy your Christmas and uh, have a very, very good Christmas time and uh, have a good day. Bye. <laughs>